Okay, let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, uh, greetings wherever you are in the world. Um, today we're going to be examining deliberative democracy and citizen assemblies. Uh, my name is Rachel Mims. I work on the citizen participation and inclusion team at the National Democratic Institute, and I'll be moderating the panels for today's event. Um, as a reminder, I'm sure you all got the notice when you joined that this event will be recorded and um, all participants will be muted throughout the event. However, there will be opportunities for you to ask questions using the question function. So I'm gonna pass things over to Ambassador Derek Mitchell, the president of NDI for opening remarks. Thank you so much, Rachel. Good to see everybody. Um, and thank you so much to everyone for setting aside time today for these very, very important discussions. Um, and as we'd like to say, good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I don't know where everyone is, but uh, thank you wherever you are for patching in. Uh, today's conversation to me, I think is very timely for, for all of us working to ensure a more vibrant and sustainable democratic future. Uh, much of NDI's assistance around the world is focused on helping democracy work in practice, not just in process, so that it delivers for citizens. Realizing this goal is more urgent than ever not least because as the world continues to struggle with the COVID-19 pandemic, poor governance remains a serious challenge both to relief efforts and overall recovery. Poor undemocratic governance will make future crises more likely and prevent concerted action on impending crises like climate change. Uh, as you all well know, the pandemic over the past year has compounded longstanding systemic problems, inequality, intolerance and exclusion. Overall, there is a critical need to address declining citizen confidence in democracy's ability to deliver public goods and be responsive in its policy making. Increasing emphasis must be placed on restoring civil political discourse and expanding spaces for inclusive citizen participation in public policy making. So today we have assembled a very talented group of presenters who are prepared to share their insights attained through extensive research and firsthand experience organizing citizen assemblies. While such grassroots deliberative processes are not new, contemporary varieties offer opportunities for innovation that can enhance the work of traditional decision-making bodies from parliaments to local councils. As we will hear, deliberative processes can lead to better policy outcomes, enhance trust between citizens and their government, and create sustainable mechanisms that bolster inclusive decision-making. These processes, these processes can take place at all levels of government and can take many forms, from polling and issue forums, which we have used in NDI programs, to citizen juries and citizen assemblies. Citizen assemblies, in fact, have been used increasingly in places like the UK, Spain, France, and Poland to address seemingly intractable, complex, and polarizing challenges. And from such experience, we can see their potential to address issues, as I mentioned before, including climate change. So this event today will explore the case for citizen assemblies and other deliberative processes as a way to counter increasing citizen alienation and other key drivers of democratic erosion. So finally, let me just thank all the panelists and partner organizations who have helped to make this event possible, including the OECD, People Powered, the Open Society Foundation, Shipyard Foundation, and TASC. Uh, we value the contribution of each partner um, because everyone has contributed to making this event possible. And I really look forward to continued close partnership with all of you going forward. I also want to acknowledge, of course, the leadership of NDI citizen participation team in this space. And in particular, the great work that is done every day by my friend, Aaron Azelton and Rachel Mims, who is just outstanding. Uh, both of whom helped uh, organize this event. Uh, I am very pleased that this fascinating and very and important event is occurring. And I, I look forward to hearing its results. And I thank, again, I thank everyone again uh, for joining, uh, taking time today. So with that, let me turn it back to Rachel Mims to kick off our first panel. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Derek. Um, so the first panel is going to discuss the principles of deliberative democracy and really provide an overview to some of the mechanisms such as citizen assemblies 
including um, some of the necessary conditions for successful implementation. How do we integrate citizen assemblies and, and different processes like this into our institutions? And what are some common misconceptions? And, and, and how do we know and understand um, the importance of deliberative democracy and citizen assemblies as it, as it relates to um, um, creating a culture of democracy or participation and also responding to some of the challenges that Derek mentioned in his opening remarks. So I'm going to start by introducing our panelists, and then um, I'll pass it over for um, presentations. Um, throughout the presentations, you can use the function, um, the question function to submit questions, and we will be taking a few questions at the end of the three presentations. Um, so our first panelist will be Claudia Schwalitz. So Claudia leads OECD's work on innovative citizen participation, which explores the paradigm change towards more participatory, deliberative, and collaborative governance. Claudia also co-authored the first OECD report on this topic, which was published last year, um, um, June 2020, called Innovative Citizen Participation and New Democratic Institutions, called Catching the Deliberative Wave. Um, our second panelist will be Martian Gerwin. He's a specialist in deliberative democracy and sustainability from Poland, and he designs and coordinates citizen assemblies. He's also the managing, he also manages the Center for Climate Assemblies, and he's the author of Citizen Assemblies, A Guide to Democracy That Works. And then our final panelist will be Shauna Cohen, who's the director of TASC, an independent think tank based in Ireland, whose mission is to address inequality and sustain democracy by translating analysis into action. Under Shauna's tenure, TASC also produced a guidebook, Learning from Ireland Citizen Assemblies, which is meant to provide practical guidance for democratic practitioners around the world. So thank you all for joining us today. And I'd like to pass it to Claudia, who's going to start us. Mm. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Rachel. And, and hello, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, I'm going to share my screen because I have a few, a few slides to, to show you. So bear with me just one second as I try and put this into slideshow full screen mode. There we go. <laughs> um, so, so my name is Claudia Kvalich. I lead the OECD's area of work around innovative citizen participation and our team is really looking at, at questions about the future of democracy a bit more broadly. What I will cover now in the next 10 minutes or so are the key, the key findings and, and uh, um, takeaways from the research that I did with my colleague Yeva Cheslunaitite that was published in this report uh, in June last year called Innovative Citizen Participation and New Democracy democratic institutions catching the deliberative wave. And it's the first empirical comparative study of representative deliberative processes, so things like citizens' assemblies, for public decision making. Um, so I won't go into too many details about this because we have a fellow Irish person on the on the panel who might talk about this a bit more. But um, what we're talking about as representative citizen, uh, representative deliberative processes, sorry, are things like the Irish Citizens Assembly that took place in 2016, 2018. Um, another example is the French Citizens Convention on Climate. Uh, so here you see 150 randomly selected people from across France who met for the course of, of, um, of numerous months, eight months, uh, to, to hear from lots of different experts and put together concrete recommendations for how France could um, lower its greenhouse gas emissions by 40% by 2030 in the spirit of social justice. Um, before I go into the key findings of the report, I thought I'd just take one minute to kind of define what we're talking about here when we talk about um, representative deliberative processes and, and citizens' assemblies in particular. Um, so at the heart of this, at the starting point, is a public authority that has a problem. Um, and so this problem gets formulated as a clear task in the form of a question, um, and it gets put to a citizens' assembly, uh, which is a broadly representative group of, of everyday people um, who are selected through a process that's usually called a democratic lottery. Um, usually there's a very large number of invitations that get sent out completely at random. So depending on the size of the, of the whether it's a municipality or a country, it could be between 10 to 30,000 invitations that get sent out. Um, amongst everybody who responds positively, there's a second random selection, um, but stratifying so that that final group that comprises the citizens assembly is broadly representative of society in terms of things like gender, age, socioeconomic status, and, and so on. 
And then the citizens assembly goes through broadly key, three key stages. The first being orientation and learning. Um, so usually there's a there's a bit of time spent at the beginning for people to get to know each other a bit, a bit of time for everyone to define what values are going to guide their deliberations, setting the ground rules for it. Um, and then they hear from lots of different experts, also, also stakeholders, um, before they, they begin what is their deliberations. Now, of course, there's a little bit more fluidity between these stages than what I'm describing here but um, the point is that there's evidence um, presented first which is then weighed and discussed and people also obviously bring in their their personal experiences into those deliberations as well um, and the, the explicit task is to collectively draft uh, recommendations off of the back of, of the deliberations about this evidence about how to solve this public problem that has been put towards them but the process doesn't end there, it ends with those recommendations, usually taking the form of a public report that has been drafted in, in the assembly's own words, going back to the public authority, and then that authority having some form of response, explaining how, why or why not they're able to accept the recommendations and how they will be implemented. In this report, we have 289 examples of such processes that have taken place between 1986 until October 2019. They come from 18 different OECD countries and also a few examples at the international level. Um, and that's just where we found the examples. We were looking really absolutely everywhere to see um, where this type of, of citizen participation has taken place. Um, the examples come from all levels of government. They, we identified off of the back of this the nuances between 12 different models of deliberative processes. So by that, I mean the differences between a citizen's assembly and a citizen's jury, uh, between a, a planning cell and a consensus conference and so on. Uh, we also identified 11 principles of good practice, uh, as well as three routes to institutionalization for how these processes are becoming a more permanent and normal part of how certain types of, of public decisions are being taken. And so here I have a, a graph that shows all of these, these case studies that we found and, and why we had this sense of the deliberative wave as something that has been building momentum over time. Um, so there was a sort of first wave in, in the early 2000s, but it's really been since 2010 um, that we've seen public authorities using this type of, of way to involve citizens more directly in policymaking more and more. Um, and what's not even on this graph is that the, the um, cutoff date for our data collection was October 2019 and our team has been collecting cases since that have happened since then and we have over 200 additional examples um, that are being added to our updated database which will hopefully be available uh, for the public in June. Um, so just to say that this wave is, is, is gaining even more momentum and this trend is something we feel um, is, is continuing and will continue. Uh, we found these examples in, in many different cases. We were initially looking everywhere, but what we found is that the vast majority have taken place in, in OECD countries. Um, a lot of the examples come from Germany, Australia, Canada, and Denmark. Um, these are countries where, as I mentioned, some of those deliberative models like citizens' juries or consensus conferences originated in some of these countries. And th th that's where some of the earliest examples started. So one of our hypotheses is that, um, you know, as, as policymakers have seen these processes used to help solve one type of public problem, it has inspired them to use the same type of process to, uh, for other problems as well. Uh, these examples come from all levels of government, so about half of them are from the local level, but we also have 30% from the regional state level, 15% from the national level, and 3% internationally. Um, so, I mean, to me, this makes a lot of sense because we have way, way, way more municipalities in in the world than we have countries. So we'll always have the most local level examples. Um, but I do show this because I think sometimes there's a bit of a myth that this type of process is only suited for, for more local decision-making, but we've seen it used actually many times to address more, I guess, yeah, I guess national level issues. And most of the examples at the regional state level come from Canada and Australia, which are federal countries. And the issues that were tackled at that level of government there would have been national level issues in, in most European countries. Uh, so just to put a little bit of perspective on that. 
one of the questions that interested us the most was what types of issues were these deliberative processes used to help address? First of all, we found that there was actually just a very wide range of different types of problems overall, um, but there were uh, clusters, I guess, of certain types of problems in particular. So issues to do with urban planning, health, environment, strategic planning and infrastructure um, came up the most often. Uh, but one thing that we found was that rather than starting with the, with the issue as trying to identify, you know, is this going to be a useful process to help me or not? We, we found that there are three types of problems that deliberative processes are particularly well suited to address. Um, so the first being values-based dilemmas. By this, I mean that sometimes a problem seems quite technical on the surface, but is actually underpinned by questions to do with values, to do with ethics or morality in different ways. So an issue, for example, like facial recognition technology seems very, very technical about, you know, when or, <laughs> or how this technology should be used, but actually has many different implications for what kind of society do we want to have? And, you know, under what circumstances, if any, um, you know, would this be acceptable as a society? And, um, you know, what kind of, of considerations would need to be in place of, of when it could be used, etc. And that takes me to the second point about complex problems that require trade-offs. Um, so these processes are not the best for if it's a very binary issue if there, or if there's a very limited amount of options that can be considered. Where they can be particularly helpful is when there's a whole, whole variety of dimensions that need to be considered, um, trade-offs to do with costs, considerations to do with budget, perhaps legislative or institutional constraints. Um, to, to help figure out where, where do people's priorities lie? Where can we find some common ground on this very complex issue? And then the third being long-term questions that help overcome some of those barriers to do with the short-term incentives of electoral cycles. Off the back of the, the data and also working a bit more qualitatively with a group of practitioners, public servants and academics, we developed the OECD's good practice principles for deliberative processes for public decision making. Um, so they cover things from, you know, I have all 11 up here, but th there's a little bit more detail about each of them in the report. Um, things like making sure that the purpose is actually very clearly stated in neutral language that's very easy to understand and actually has a question and a task within it. Uh, Things like having transparency about all of the different expert presentations, transparency about how people were recruited, how were the experts chosen, all of that. Um, things to do with inclusiveness, to break down the barriers to participation, like providing payments to, to, to the members of these assemblies, um, providing childcare or transport costs, um, providing enough time. Um, so we recommend at least a minimum of four full days uh, for deliberation on a complex issue. So these sorts of things. I don't have time to go into them in detail, but happy to pick up on any questions if, if people have them after. So I would say that my, my main takeaway from all of this research that I would want to leave you with is that deliberative processes are not some sort of silver bullet solution that can help solve all sorts of problems. But we see from the evidence that I emphasize if they are designed well, they can help to solve hard problems and have shown to increase public trust. So I will leave it there. Thank you very much for your attention and look forward to your questions. Thanks, Claudia, for that great overview. And I would implore folks to check the link that we dropped in the chat box um, to the resource Catching the Deliberative Way. There's a lot of really great um, information in there. Claudia really was only able to give us the top lines. But if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A function. We'd be happy to answer them at the end. I'm now going to pass it over to Martian, who's going to uh, give a presentation. Hey, hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here and to be able to, to talk with you. Actually, I'm a bit more optimistic than Claudia with regards to the potential of citizens SMEs. But let me just uh, show you what I uh, mean by this. So uh, first of all, uh, I would like to start with a little background story, how I actually got involved in this thing, which is called deliberative democracy. Actually, initially, I was interested in nature conservation. You know? And I was thinking that nature conservation ideally would mean for me uh, living in a forest and counting deer. This is how I imagine it. And then when I started to think about it, like what are the issues, what are the challenges related to nature conservation, I have realized that actually everything is fine with nature. It's just the, the human lifestyle, the, the way people live. This is the issue. What I have also realized that there are so many solutions which are related to how we generate energy, 
how we consume and produce food. And there are so many also solutions with regards to transportation. And behind every solution, there is a decision-making process. Someone has made it into the law. In what way? How? Who did it? So, and what was the reason behind it? Was it the, for the benefit of a public good? But perhaps it was something else. So, and I have also realized that the, the solutions are ready. They are, they are there, like energy generation. It's easy for us to make this transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy. And definitely this is supported by, for example, Polish society. Nevertheless, politicians in Poland still continue to subsidize fossil fuels and extraction of coal, particular extraction of coal. So there is something wrong with the way uh, our political system operates. And in the way to improve it, I got involved in the democracy. So is, are the citizens SMD the answer? Well, yes, uh, they are a great tool for decision-making um, process and for decision-making and to solving uh, complex uh, uh, problems. But I would also uh, encourage to make the, the next step, uh, which is at the end of the presentation. So for me personally, the, the main inspiration was where the uh, citizens jurists uh, and citizens SMBs organized in Australia, uh, but and the, basing upon the processes which, uh, which, were which took place there, uh, I have created the first uh, like a model for, for the Polish one. And then it has started and so far, the, the citizens assemblies in, in Poland has been, have been organized in seven cities. I think there is also this very nice example from Belgium, from the region which is called the German speaking community, East Belgium, and they have created the first in the world permanent citizens assembly, which is currently uh, operating. So why do I think those uh, citizens assemblies work? Well, first of all, the people who are making those decisions, this randomly selected group, they are independent. And this is crucial. There are no elections. There are no campaigns. There is no collecting money. Fund there is no fundraising. These are just completely independent decision makers, thanks to the process of random selection. So there is, since the demographic criteria are included in the composition of the group, there is a diversity of perspective. There are men, there are women, there are young people, there are senior citizens and so on. People from many different walks of life. And the process makes sense from the perspective of decision-making because it starts with this learning phase that Claudia has, has mentioned. So um, in our model, all stakeholders such as NGOs, institutions, they are all invited on equal grounds. They, there is no, this, uh, there is no like question, oh, I've got more money, so maybe, I will pay for billboards, you know, and my, my campaign will be better. And it doesn't exist in the, in the citizens' assembly. It's just, if you are a stakeholder, you are welcome to come. There are certain rules to it, but nevertheless, the, the ground rule is the process is open for stakeholders. And from the very beginning, it is emphasized that the common good uh, is at the heart of the process. This is why we have met to develop the solutions which will benefit us all as a local community or a country. And thanks to the uh, presence of uh, facilitators, the process allows uh, high quality also discussion, deliberation, this discussion of pros and cons. So, uh, and the whole process works because we know from the experience and there are like hundreds of the pro deliberative processes across the world, but uh, we know from the experience that it does provide high quality and well thought out decisions which are made for, for, the, for the common good. That's why I'm very, optimistic with regards to uh, promoting them and introducing in other countries as well. So uh, there are certain standards. Uh, Claudia has mentioned the good principles of OECD, good principles um, of practice. So for us, there, there are a uh, few more. Uh, I would mention, for example, that the, there is this inclusion of widest practical um, range of perspectives. This is very important for us, the invitation of all stakeholders. And definitely it's included in the OECD principles as well, the independent coordination. And there is also, uh, what we do emphasize is the time for reflection. For example, the, the current um, citizens assembly in the city of Poznan, which we are running, uh, actually takes around 
three and a half months. It's, it's a long time, but it, it is important to think through, to digest all the issues related to the topic of uh, how can we adapt urban uh, forests and green areas to climate change and how can we make this transition from coal to something else, hopefully. And in the city of Poznan, we have also introduced the new standard, which in English is called FUN. And in Polish, it's it's fine. It's not possible to translate it directly. Some some people say it's like awesomeness or coolness or something like this. What does it mean in practice? For example, um, when we organize like today an afternoon meeting for assembly members, then we send them like a recipe for a cake, uh, for a ideal vegan brownie. So it's not essential, but it's fun. So and and for in order to make this process enjoyable. It is, I see it personally as, as an important part of it. So there are some guiding principles behind the standards, uh, such as democracy for everyone, and also that the, the aim of the whole process is to improve the quality of life and to come up with uh, well thought out decisions. And in the city of Poznan, we have also introduced a new guiding principle, and that is that uh, acknowledging and um, respecting human dignity and subjectivity, I hope that's the right word in English, it's crucial for, well, for a well-functioning democracy. So the, the whole process is run by the coordinating team, but there is also this monitoring team, which makes sure that, that the standards are kept. In the monitoring team, the members of it can be on the local level, representatives of the mayor, of the city council, of NGOs, and also academics. And in the model that we use, there is also the process of arbitration. If there is something that the coordinating team or a monitoring team cannot agree on. And uh, for, uh, for in some cases, especially in countries where uh, there is no like, local capacity to organize uh, and design this process well, my suggestion would be also to include in the governance structure the design team to, to make sure that the rules and procedures, that the processes for the citizens' assembly are designed well from the, from the very beginning. So, and they are all uh, described in something that we call the Rivendell model. This is available for download from our website. This is a set of rules and procedures for citizens' assemblies. Okay, and now let's go just very briefly through the whole process. So uh, there are se several ways of uh, inviting um, citizens to participate in a citizen assembly. You can send a personal letter with, in with invitations. That's my favorite one. But you can also send letters to household. Uh, certainly like a traditional way of inviting people by a recruiter who is going from door to door is it's also possible. Uh, here is the example of the letters that which were sent out in the city of Poznan. Uh, this is the example from Wrocław inside the letter, inside the envelope, you can see the, the, the letter from the from the mayor. And there is also the part with a frequently asked question. And what is very important is that the, um, all assembly members receive a certain stipend. Uh, in Poland, this is around 150 euros. And there, in this letter in the city of Wrocław, there is also the information from the mayor uh, that the results, the recommendations of the citizens assembly will be treated as binding if they receive the support of at least 80%. And in these boxes, you can see uh, 20,000 letters of invitations which are ready to be sent out to the residents of the city of Wrocław in Poland. Uh, once people register, once they decide, okay, I would like to participate in it, there is this process of random selection. And the way we do it, the final stage is with rolling a dice, which is transmitted live on the internet. This is the TV studio in the city of Gdańsk where the um, uh, random selection process was, was organized. There is also the electronic way, the new one that we have, which was, which was developed in Poland. It's based on the algorithm, which is called simulated annealing. This kind of technical, but it ensures that all those demographic criteria are included in the final members. And once you have your group, it's crucial to create a good atmosphere to let people to get to know each other, to feel comfortable and so on. Uh, in Poland, when we organize meetings in person, uh, we use the groups of four. There is no table in between. And so it's a different uh, format. Nevertheless, it works. It was inspired by the method, which is called 
World Cafe. Uh, the facilitators uh, prepare the, the, the rules for the, the like agreement of participants, how the meetings are, um, are carried out. There is, for example, the respect, being open, listening, not interrupting, and things like this. Definitely, this is something which helps. The learning phase includes both presentations given by experts and by stakeholders. And if there is a time for it, after the presentation, there is like a short discussion in small groups. And then there is a time for, for questions and answers. And this part is transmitted live in the, on the internet, so you can connect your laptop to the TV and you can watch it at home just as if it was a, a meeting in the in the parliament. So this is all like very for real. So here is the map of the citizens assemblies in Poland. The the orange stars or the blue or the maybe they are not that orange, maybe the yellow stars are the currently um, the, the citizens assemblies which are currently taking uh, place and the green one uh, green ones are those which were completed. And what is crucial and um, what we have got in Poland from the very beginning is the impact that, the, for example, the mayor comes at the, for the first meeting of the Citizens Assembly. This is the mayor, the former mayor of Gdańsk, and he says that the, the results will be clear, treated by me as binding if they, reach, if, they reach, if they reach this level of support of 80%. And here you can see the, the mayor of, of Poznań, like it was like a month ago. This It's an online assembly, but he said basically the same, but the, the results will be implemented. And here you have the, the mayor of the city of Krakow, which says also in the short movie, which uh, uh, mm, what's the word for it, uh, um, promotes the citizens assembly in the city of Krakow. He also says that all the uh, final recommendations, the decisions of the assembly members will be implemented. But the final step for, for it all is, it's actually for me to introduce a full scale model for a deliberative democracy uh, if, if for which the citizens assemblies are, are the base and where you don't have general elections at all. It's, it's completely possible to, to design a political system like this. If you would like to learn more about how the single topic citizens assemblies organized, there is this guide that uh, Rachel mentioned at the beginning. And if there are questions also for me after the, after the meeting today, here is my address. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Martian. And uh, we also post, put a link to the guide in the chat, so feel free to take a look at it. Um, and thank you so much, I think, for giving us a, a really great um, detailed look at the process of assemblies, but also this, this vision you have in terms of assemblies being used, I think, um, to, to, to replace or to, well, maybe not replace, but to, to be used in partnership with institutions in a different way. And I think, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about that um, um, in the Q&A period. So I'd like to uh, pass it over to Shauna, who's gonna give a presentation next. Hey, hey Shauna, you're on mute. Yep. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Sorry about that. Okay, so um, I'm uh, sorry about that. Um, so I am from um, going to just do this uh, play from the start. Here you go. I'm going to talk to you about um, our work at TASK. Uh, we are a think tank in Dublin. We've been around for 20 years and our focus, as Rachel said, is on inequality and democracy. We've had several um, projects over the last two decades on democracy. Uh, I just wanted to give you a heads up about those. And then my colleague, Sean McCabe, is going to talk a bit later about uh, the People's Transition Assemblies, which are the latest iteration of our democracy work. And they are taking place at a local level. And it's an interesting complement to what um, Martian just talked about. So. Um, we had a national audit of democracy in Ireland, and that was um, a commission based exercise. And then we had a publication called Power to the People, which talked about um, the successes and failures of that audit. Um, a drawback was a level of participation and preaching to the choir, which I think assemblies uh, try to overcome in the sense you don't want 
the people who are already interested in deliberation to be the people who participate. So the random, the process of randomly choosing participants and soliciting them through an independent company, I think has worked effectively in Ireland. So this is another, um, was, this was funded by the Atlantic Philanthropies, which is a now closed foundation that was started by Chuck Feeney and really invested in Irish civil society. This is by far our most downloaded uh, publication. It's an over, open government toolkit that provides um, information on how to get involved, especially in local government. And then we have an ebook on the experience of Irish citizen assemblies, which is a bit of a compliment to what Martian just talked to you about. And it was funded by um, OSF. And it, but it's based explicitly in the Irish citizen assemblies, which I'm gonna talk about in just a second. Um, so, and I'm going to be a bit, uh, to be really honest with you, I'm going to be a bit um, positive and, and, and a bit cynical because of the experience. Now, Ireland has a, it's a small country, it's 5 million people, and local politics are very important because it's a small country and people know each other. One of the things that's happened in Ireland is that national level politicians, um, there's a concentration of power at the national level, but also national level politicians, members of the Dáil, are expected to be engaged at a local level to attend funerals, to go to weddings, to, to attend local activities, to show up, to be really frank, to be show up at the pub. And I think that that kind of expectation of, of national leaders has helped strengthen the potential of deliberative democracy in Ireland, because you already have this local national link in national representation. So I think setting up an assembly fit quite well. But the initial motivation for setting up deliberative democracy forums in Ireland was the um, was austerity. So to take it into context, I think the national government realized that they were imposing policies that weren't going to be very popular. So as, a, as an outlet, they set up a forum for deliberative democracy to engage the public in decisions, to, decisions that eventually were, some of them were going to be um, popular and some of them not going to be very popular. And I'll talk about that just in a second. So the first one was We the People, and that was in 2011. The next one was the Constitutional Convention, and that was a predecessor to the Citizens Assembly. The, um, the participation in the first two was different. It included policymakers, and so as one evaluator, David Farrell, told me of the Constitutional Convention, you'd have Jerry Adams sitting next to, Jerry Adams is the former leader of Sinn Féin, um, to, sitting next to just, you know, Joe Bloggs. So it was, everybody was equal, but they took out the policymakers for the Citizens Assemblies which have been largely successful, um, but there have been drawbacks. And I'm going to talk about that. In, um, so the, they they address very serious issues in terms of cultural and social change. And the most sort of visible, I think, internationally was repealing the Eighth Amendment, which uh, was abortion. It was in the Constitution prior to the Citizens Assembly and the eventual referendum, abortion was outlawed even if it cost um, the mother her life and the fetus. So there was, this, there was a very um, public case of a, of a woman who died in childbirth because they wouldn't um, perform an abortion. And um, that fed in, there was a citizen's assembly on repealing the eighth. And in such a sensitive issue in a polarized climate where you had a, a body of, a, part, a portion of the population was very against repealing it and was being influenced I, I, by, evangelical groups across the world, particularly in the US. And then you had a growing movement in Ireland, particularly among not just women, but among younger generations supporting the repeal. The Citizens Assembly allowed for careful, moderated deliberation of the topic and eventually led to a very successful referendum where over 70% voted for repeal, which has happened. Now, you also had um, an assembly on the environment and you had one on aging. Now the environment was less successful. And this is one of the drawbacks of the assembly. They make recommendations. The citizens' assemblies were set up by the parliament, as I mentioned um, earlier. The issue is if the if if you make recommendations to the parliament and the parliament goes, oh my god, this is a bit sensitive, and if we try to implement this, we're going to have a blowback, which happened with water charges. There were protests in Ireland. There's, it was in the middle of austerity, and, and the public were like, this is enough. We're not going to pay water charges. But the citizens' assembly and the environment was was behind taxation to, to um, promote climate action. So you get into these tensions, the assembly is a safe space to have these conversations, but you put it out there um, to the public and they might be like, no, no, thank you. I, I think we'll pass on this. Um, just as another cautionary note, the 
citizens' assemblies are taking place, um, as Claudia mentioned, within a larger movement of citizen engagement, which is great. It's fantastic. We haven't talked about it, but participatory budgeting is even more popular in some ways than these deliberative democratic practices, like in Paris or in Madrid. And I, I think that there's been largely success, but it's only a small portion, typically, of council budgets that are allowed. And you get you get sort of you're preaching to the choir. And I think that there's a lot of work to be done in participatory budgeting that could also be um, influential in improving citizens' assemblies. Now, the second one is this whole promotion of citizen engagement. And I'm familiar with that because I've done a lot of work in Morocco. And there was huge investment by the World Bank and the National Initiative for Human Development. And I actually did an evaluation for the World Bank on that. The problem is you have this great initiative and millions and millions of dollars have been poured into it. And you have lots of local initiatives that are supposed to foster the capability of citizens at a local level to engage in social problems at a local level and to interact with counselors. Um, so to become more powerful as political actors, but at a national level, that's been completely not ignored, but it, the government's gone in the opposite direction. To be fair, I think that the Moroccan government, you could say objectively, has become more repressive at the same time that the INDH and French has been has been developing. So it's not necessary, and, and Marcia and I, we can talk about Poland. It's not necessary that deliberative democracy at a local level will lead to an opening up at a national level. And you also have localization of authority, where if you look at the metropolitan mayors in the UK, but again, this doesn't necessarily mean that democratization at, at a national level is gonna happen. In the UK, you could say that there's been a centralization of power and there's now tension between the local mayors and the national government, especially around resources. So to give a bit more nuanced um, understanding of, of uh, citizens' assemblies in, in light of um, what Marston and Claudia have said in our, our own research, um, which was uh, funded by OSF, we have found that you need political buy-in early, and Sean will talk about this a bit later. The citizens' assemblies that have been developed without that political buy-in, like in, in Ireland, they've been mandated by parliament, means that if they don't have that political buy-in and you're trying to get it as you develop, then it's, it will undermine your, your potential, uh, your, your possibility of success. Likewise, negative media attention um, from an early uh, can undermine the findings. And there was a case in um, Germany, uh, not Germany, the German speaking population in Belgium, where this, um, where negative media attention undermined the citizens assembly. Okay, so the topics have to be carefully selected. In Ireland, the parliament has mandated the topics, which has presented its own risks. As one of the evaluators of the citizens assembly in Ireland has noted, Policymakers will leave aside the topics they really don't want to discuss, like welfare reform, which means that it's serving a purpose for public discussion, but not necessarily addressing some critical policy issues. We also found that a lot of times members would uh, receive the materials a bit late in the day, so they weren't as knowledgeable about the issue as they should have been. One lesson we did learn was that discussion should be private or without kind of live streaming, which the first day of the, national, the citizens assemblies in Ireland were live stream media attention and academic observers. So you need that kind of private space that's moderated by the chair so you can be open about your views. And this is a long quote and I'll just summarize it, summarize it for you that um, they, uh, which I found really interesting is that the older members of the citizens assembly I guess predictably, we're less likely to change their minds about the topic. Whereas if you're younger and you have lower levels of knowledge about the topic, you're more likely to change your mind. So that's just something to think about, but it makes sense. Um, again, just to sum up, and Sean is going to go into this a bit more when he talks about how we're setting up the People's Transition Assemblies, which are based on climate action in two pilots in Ireland. One is a rural area in the north of the, of the Republic and one is um, in Dublin. Their benefits and their risks of citizens' assemblies. And I totally agree with Martian that there's a lot of potential for citizens' assemblies as they develop. They provide a platform for, for public discussion of sensitive issues like the Eighth Amendment in Ireland. On the other hand, that if you, you had recommendations coming out of the environment, citizens' assembly, which were um, either shelved by the government or met with protests by the public. You need to bring representatives from different backgrounds. Now, the Citizens Assembly in Ireland is focused on income, but you also need to, as Martian pointed out, take, a, take account of ethnicity and gender and age. 
Um, and it, it is interesting that if you take people, if you bring people in of a certain sort of maybe income and age, they'll be less likely to change their um, views. There needs to be a formalized process of feedback to the legislature, not just at a local level, though that's quite important, but also at a national level. Um, you don't want to avoid necessary policy debates through citizens assemblies. You don't want them to be out there as a showcase here, we're democratic, but you're not actually tackling issues. It would be a risk in Ireland to say, okay, we're gonna keep going with the citizens assemblies. In the meantime, after the pandemic, we're gonna reimpose austerity. But look, we've got democracy going on over here. I think that that would be a problem. It would be kicking the can down the road for avoiding discussion of, of immediate issues, like let's say unemployment among young people, which is would merit in Ireland a citizens assembly. Finally, um, I think it's very important in, in like for future events on citizens assembly or deliberative democracy, that you don't isolate the citizens assembly from other democratization processes. And I guess I'm coming at this, not just from my experience in Ireland, but also in the UK and Morocco. You want other mechanisms for feedback into policy besides the citizens assembly, because yes, it just represents a small portion of the population. For instance, public consultations. You don't want limited public consultations into policy. You want them to be much more open and transparent. How do, they, how do government officials take into account the information from a public consultation? Who do they seek it from? Because it could end up being the, the choir speaking to the government representatives, people who are already sitting in meetings with government representatives. You'd want more democratization of how policy is implemented, for instance, in public procurement practices. They need to be much more transparent and there needs to be much more push in places like Ireland and the UK about social value and let's say democratic value in, instead of just value for money, which is typically the, um, the mechanism. Whoever gives the lowest bid is, is favored to get the bid. And that's not, um, it's not also transparent how those decisions are made. And so that needs to open up as a complement to the, to the aims behind a citizens assembly. And then you need to address economic inequality. One side, it's great to invite people together to talk about a topic and a citizens assembly who are from different socioeconomic groups, but you need to actually address that difference at the same time. Yeah. So just in conclusion, we're very much supportive of a task because they've citizens assemblies have been a very central part of politics and political development over the past 15 years in Ireland, but and especially in a pol polarized political environment, but it's not a panacea. Just as a heads up, like in, there should be a citizens assembly on unification in Ireland and there's a push for it. And that would be an example of, of, of a discussion in a careful protected environment of an extremely sensitive issue. And, and that should be the mechanism to address it. But at the same time, you can't ignore all of the other issues that would be surrounded with unification. For instance, the health, a national health service or addressing inequality on an all Ireland basis. Anyway, thank you. Thank you for the invitation and thank you for inviting my colleague, Sean, as well. I will stop sharing now. Thanks everyone. And, and thanks to all the panelists um, provided some really interesting insights. Uh, we do have time for a couple of questions um, and I um, will um, post two questions to the panelists. Um, so the first question, um, I'd like to start with Claudia. Um, so there's a section, but anybody can answer this first question. Um, there's a section in the manual around reimagining democratic institutions and how we embed this type of public deliberation um, into our existing institutions or, or policy making processes. And I'd like you just to talk a little bit more about, you know, um, how do we um, ensure that these processes are, are, are um, being integrated, but also like what's the responsibility of democratic institutions in being responsive to this new wave and, and, and new interest in um, deliberative processes. And then um, the second question is around who, de who decides the issue. So um, how does the issue get selected and does it emerge from citizen demand or is it more from the government or from government agency? And, and Shauna, you, you touched on this a bit in terms of, you know, some issues, um, you know, being on the table versus other issues, you know, um, governments explicitly are stating that you can't talk about that or that that's not going to be an issue that gets discussed in an assembly. Um, so um, um, feel free to, uh, to kick us off, Claudia, and then um, for the panelists, you can answer both or, or one of the questions. 
Yeah, sounds good. Those are both really good questions. And I mean, I had to kind of filter out what to include in the opening presentation because I could give a whole 10 minutes on actually more on the institutionalization question itself. But uh, I'm glad we have time to talk about it. And I actually think there's a, a link to your second question about how our topics chosen, because I mean, in the report, we had identified three kind of ways that we've seen institutionalization happening of how these processes are becoming more embedded into policymaking. So they become a, a normal stage of the decision-making process rather than something that just happens in a one-off way. Um, so one of those ways is the creation of a kind of more permanent or ongoing body of randomly selected citizens. And so Martin made reference to this as well, but one of the, one of the examples of where this has happened is in the German-speaking region of, of Belgium, called of Belgien, where in February 2019, the parliament in that region unanimously voted to put in place what's called the Citizens' Council. Uh, the Citizens' Council is comprised of 24 random selected citizens and they have an agenda setting role. Uh, they are the ones who decide what should be the, the two or three issues every year that get put to citizens panels. And each of those citizens panels is a deliberative process in itself, um, which which within this legislation, it, it now explains that the recommendations from the citizens panels will have to have at least two parliamentary debates. Um, and the second role of that citizens council is to monitor that that actually happens and follow up to the recommendations and so on. So it's a really interesting example of where you see this is not a replacement to representative democracy. And I mean, that's a whole other debate. I don't know if Martin wants to go there, but it's a complement to the existing institutions. The decision-making power ultimately still rests with the parliamentarians, but the process opens up to also include ordinary citizens and also gives them a chance to decide what should be on the table in the first place. And the first Citizens Council, um, I mean, the first topic for a panel that the Citizens Council chose was actually how to improve the working conditions of healthcare workers. This was back in the autumn of 2019, before the COVID pandemic actually became a thing. So I think it also demonstrates to, in a way of, of why you can trust citizens to be raising important and serious issues that they feel are not getting enough attention by, by politicians for, for whatever reason. Um, and then I'll very briefly just say that the two other ways that we've we've seen happening, institutionalization happening so far is one, um, it's kind of like the the necessity of a deliberative process happening under certain conditions. So for instance, in, in the state of Oregon in the United States, um, there's a process called the Citizens Initiative Review, where before certain ballot measures, it's a state that has a, a strong in initiative review process where, there, where citizens or, or organizations or parliamentarians are able to put forth measures for, for a public vote. Um, and so there's an institutionalized mechanism called the Citizens Initiative Review, where there's around 24 randomly selected citizens that have a, have a chance to meet for at least four full days. They hear from both sides of the, the pro and con side of the ballot measure. They hear from a wide range of experts and they together write a collective um, statement that goes into the voters pamphlet uh, for all of the voters in the state. So that's one way that you could see institutionalization. But another way of that happening is the 2011 French law on bioethics, for instance, where any new law or revisions to existing laws concerning bioethics have to go through a very rigorous citizen deliberation process. Um, and then finally, the third route um, is actually something that uh, happens a lot in Poland, but is the is the creation of rules that allow citizens to demand a, a deliberative process under certain conditions. So usually that's through the form of a petition that needs to have a minimum number of signatures. And instead of that, um, you know, initiating a referendum or a parliamentary debate, it initiates a deliberative process like a citizens assembly on the issue that the citizens bring forward. Uh, and it's also the case in the Austrian state of Vorarlberg. Um, so yeah, so there's quite a bit happening there. And at the moment, actually, I should say at the OECD, I'm working on a, a guide um, that kind of gives an overview specifically about institutionalization and the considerations for, for policymakers um, really thinking about this in particular. How do you move from the one-off ad hoc processes, which as, as Shana also said, are very much dependent on political will into something that becomes more normal, um, but for certain types of of policy issues because again I don't think this is a panacea and it's part of a much broader bigger picture of, of citizen engagement and, and and other things so I'll leave it there. <laughs> Russian, I saw that you um, unmuted would you like to go next? Yeah, just very briefly with regards to the topic selection uh, there is an interesting uh, method which is coming up in the city of Mostar in Bosnia. Uh, first of all 
the ideas for the topic for the citizens assembly will be collected from anyone living in the city then there will be a workshop for ngos to create like a shorter list let's say six maybe ten ideas then this list will go to the <clears throat> civil servants uh, city councillors, representative of the mayor and they will uh, come up with the top three and the top three will be voted upon by the citizens themselves and uh, it's a new thing so I, i'm still like processing uh, how it, it's going to work but when the letters with invitations will be sent out to, part, uh, to residents of the city to participate in the citizens assembly, they will be able to choose the topic and whether or not they're going to participate. So this is something completely new. I'm very curious how it's going to play out. Great, uh, thank you, Martian, for sharing. Um, Shana, did you want to add anything either to the first or second question? Um, I think the answers about institutionalization were quite um, thorough. I, I think um, I think it's great, actually, what you talked about in Bosnia, the fact that because it's um, been very politically led in in Ireland. Um, I um, I noticed a question. I was just I don't know if you want me to. There was a question that was in the pan, um, to the panelists about um, follow up, whether it has an impact on um, further engagement in um, citizen. Um, like interest in politics. And I think that that would be a great study and I don't know about it. I think one, one uh, sort of disappointing trend in Ireland is that the citizens assemblies of course bond with lower turnout in votes. And I don't know if that's, uh, if one has to do with the other, but um, in, in a sense of like distrust and representative democracy corresponds with greater faith in local deliberation. And I would be interested in what the other panelists have to say about that. Um, but uh, I think that um, in terms of, ins I don't know if there will be another citizens assembly in Ireland, but I would imagine they would, but it will continue to be on topics that are morally and culturally and socially sensitive, but not necessarily about economic inequality. So I was also reassured to hear about healthcare workers. Um, just to jump in before folks start to answer. So there were two questions that came in um, and these are the final two questions we'll take. So um, the one Sean is referring to, um, states that the random selection of citizens to participate in deliberative forums seems like a natural experiment. Has there been any follow-up research on the increased level of engagement in civic and political life beyond the deliberative initiative or beyond participating in an assembly or participatory budgeting, for example? And then the second question um, was, are policy outcomes that are proposed by assemblies more progressive? Um, as they're understood more broadly um, than those that are created through other channels, such as the, the policy decisions that come through parliaments, for example. And if there are any examples or what are your experiences in terms of like um, the, um, the types of decisions that get made and where they fall on the scale in terms of being more progressive and inclusive or not. Shall we just jump in? Uh to those uh, well on the on the first question about the, the natural experiment definitely and I feel like it's a shame there isn't more research on that because I feel there should be but the the research that exists does show that first of all because of the random selection process it also brings in people into the room who maybe have never voted who've never gone to a town hall meeting or done any other form of consultation so it's already kind of reaching the kind of unengaged in a way that a lot of other other more kind of open processes tend to tend to not even bring into the room in the first place. Um, and then after that, uh, it also shows that especially those people who were not active before are much more likely to become more civically engaged, more likely to volunteer, more likely to vote in the next election and so on. Um, some of the longitudinal work that uh, John Gastel and his colleagues have done around the Citizens Initiative Review, I would say is where the most thorough evidence lies so far. Um, I'd have to look in, in the report to, to have a few other studies to list off, off the top of my head. Um, and and I mean, I'm happy to come on the second question as well, but uh, letting other other panelists also have a chance to to say. So I think it's a, also a question: uh, How do you define progressive? Uh, definitely, you can expect the results, the recommendations of a citizens assembly, be like people centered, um, taking uh, the recommendations would care uh, would take would include this this aspect of of common good. And I would say that, what does it mean to design the process well? I would say that it means to bring the best out of people. And if you think that the, that the outcome will be like aligned with, the, uh, with people's hearts, 
then yes, you can expect it, but you need to design the process well. Um, as I mentioned, I think um, the Irish government's been very good at picking out really uh, either global challenges like the environment or very sensitive topics that have to deal with social and cultural change in, in Ireland. I think that abortion and the current one is on gender equality and then there was the marriage equality referendum. They've linked it very well also to referendums. I think that that has been done um, much better in Ireland, I'd have to say, than in the UK where they could have done with the Citizens Assembly on Brexit before they launched into a yes or no up and down um, question about whether or not to leave the EU. I think that was a mistake on the British um, David Cameron's part. But on, I, I think that you can't really say if they're progressive, I'd agree with Martian if they're not. I think that there's a whole swath of issues like austerity. Um, or uh, taxation or welfare reform that haven't, as far as I know, have never been addressed in a citizens assembly. And I, maybe the case in, in Belgium is different, but I, uh, so I wouldn't necessarily call them left-leaning or progressive. I think that they're a good way of dealing with sensitive issues that have to be dealt with, but not necessarily core economic issues. And perhaps one tiny thing I'll add is that um, we've also seen that these processes have really been initiated by governments or parties or politicians across the political spectrum. Um, like I'm, I was right before this, I was planning an event we're doing to launch the, this report with a Belgian audience and we have politicians involved from three different political parties who are also within the different levels of government leading on initiatives of, of deliberative democracy. And in Ostbelgien, uh, the German speaking region of Belgium, um, all political parties, all six of them voted unanimously to institute this. So I think that also shows that this isn't something that's kind of associated with just one party or movement either. Um, I'm still thinking, is it possible to organize a national level citizens assembly in the country run by a person called Victor and another is Vladimir? Oh, that will be kind of risky. <laughs> Actually, I think that's a good good spot to, to end this panel. So I want to thank um, Claudia, Martian, and Shauna for, for participating and sharing your insights. Um, this has been really fantastic. Um, I'd like to now transition to our second panel and, and introduce our second group of speakers. Um, so thank you all. So our second panel um, is going to highlight some practical examples of citizen assemblies. With a, with a clear focus on environmental justice and climate change processes. There were also a couple questions that we didn't get to in the first panel in terms of ap applicability of, of, uh, of climate assemblies or citizen assemblies in other countries, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, and also questions around inclusion that I hope maybe we can address um, in this panel. So I'd like to first um, um, introduce our speaker. So first we'll have Nikhil Kumar. So Nikhil is a research and policy associate at People Powered Global Hub for Participatory Democracy, where he works on resources and participatory initiatives to address climate change, including climate assemblies and climate sensitive participatory budgeting. And then next we will have Sean McCabe. So Sean um, is the executive manager at TASC Climate Justice Center. Um, and he's also worked as a policy officer with the Mary Robinson Foundation on climate justice. Um, and during this time, he led negotiations um, on leading to the, to the Paris Agreement and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And then our last speaker will be um, Kazia Pulowska. So Kazia is a civic participation specialist She's a member of the civic participation team at Shipyard Foundation, and she's been engaged in um, several assemblies, two citizen assemblies as a coordinator and facilitator, and two others as a monitoring board member. Um, so thank you all for um, joining us. I'll uh, pass it over to Nikhil, who will um, be presenting first. Thanks so much, Rachel. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Okay, and then present. Okay, so hi, I'm Nikhil. I'm, as Rachel said, I'm the Research and Policy Associate at People Powered Global Hub for Participatory Democracy. And today I'll be introducing climate assemblies. And I'll start with a brief introduction of our work at People Powered. And then I'll share what a climate assembly is, what it looks like in practice, some key lessons from the case studies, and then how we can help at People Powered. So a bit about People Powered. 
Our mission is to expand people's power to make government decisions by supporting organizations and governments that are building participatory democracy around the world. Participatory democracy takes many forms and at People Powered, we focus on five, participatory budgeting, participatory policymaking and planning, of course, citizen juries and assemblies and legislative theater. What we do, our work can be broken down into three main areas, sharing resources, building power and changing policies. So I'll briefly talk about those. First, we share resources. We've compiled different resources for practitioners and advocates on our website, including many resources on participatory climate initiatives. We also build power through our various capacity building programs, including online courses and a peer mentorship program called Rising Stars. And we work to change policies by coordinating advocacy efforts across countries. And this work can be illustrated by the courses we've given on climate initiatives like participatory budgeting for climate change and how to start a climate assembly. So what is a climate assembly? A climate assembly is a randomly selected group of community members that makes policy recommendations to address climate change. Here's how it works. As Claudia mentioned, first a convening authority, usually a local or national government, convenes the assembly and selects residents to form a mini public that's broadly representative of the general population. The, the members then hear testimony from experts and advocates like climate scientists, industry advocates, and civil society organizations so that they can form opinions about the issues around climate change. And then they deliberate and agree on a set of rec recommendations which are presented to the government. What does this look like in practice? Climate assemblies have taken place both at the local level and the national level. So I'll share a bit about climate assemblies that have been organized already in Warsaw, Camden, France, and Scotland. So Kasha will share a bit more about the Warsaw Climate Assembly in a minute, but I did wanna share a bit about the advocacy campaign that led up to it. The advocacy campaign began online with the idea being shared on Facebook and in other forums and grassroots movements like Extinction Rebellion, Youth Climate Movement and Earth Strike came together with NGOs to act as the Climate Assembly's initiators. They collected signatures for a petition which was given to the mayor in a public event. And then the initiators met with city officials to discuss the Climate Assembly and choose a topic which was energy efficiency and renewable energy. The Climate Assembly took place in November, 2020. Camden in London in the United Kingdom organized the first local climate assembly in the UK in July, 2019. During the assembly, a group of over 50 residents met three times and they agreed on 17 recommendations for residents, community groups, businesses, and the local council to limit the impact of climate change. By showing that climate assemblies can be successful, Camden and other local authorities laid the groundwork for the UK parliament to call for a national climate assembly which took place about six months after Camden's assembly. At the national level, France's Citizens Convention on Climate was called for by the French President Macron in 2019. And it was composed of 150 citizens who at the end of the assembly submitted 149 recommendations to the government. And regarding technology, the convention used the Decidim platform to gather public input which was presented to the assembly members for consideration in their deliberations. And it's important to note that transparency is key when using digital tools. Decidim is an open source platform, meaning that the algorithms used to influence debate can be investigated by the public. And it's also important to plan outreach to different community groups when gathering public input that will be considered by the assembly members so that the input is still broadly representative of the population in terms of gender, region, and other factors. And finally, I'll share a bit about Scotland's Climate Assembly, which just last week submitted its interim report to the Scottish Parliament. 
The framing question of Scotland's Climate Assembly, which took place from November 2020 to March of this year, was how should Scotland change to tackle the climate emergency in an effective and fair way? This question sets the scale of the Climate Assembly and asks members to balance efficacy and fairness. And it creates a broad scope for the recommendations, asking members to consider any changes that could address the climate emergency. So what are the key lessons that we can take away from these case studies? There are many, but I'll talk about five. So first, different levels of government have different potential for change. When, if you're trying to decide whether to organize a climate assembly at the local or national level, an important consideration is which lever, levers of power are controlled by which level of government. Since local and national governments have control over different policies that influence climate change, like agriculture, transportation, energy, and so on, the relevant level of government will depend on what aspect of climate change you want to address. And one level isn't necessarily better than the other. Lesson two, climate assemblies are possible in the global south. It's true that with the exception of Poland, most climate assemblies have been organized in global north countries in Western Europe, North America. However, the Warsaw case shows that it is possible to organize a climate assembly in countries with relatively fewer resources if there's political will and enough capacity for organization and facilitation. And one idea is that since global North countries have contributed much more to greenhouse gas emissions, climate assemblies in the global North might focus more on climate change mitigation and emissions reductions, while those in the global South could focus more on adaptation to climate change impacts. Lesson three, you should center climate justice at all stages of the process, from advocacy to design to implementation. For example, in the design phase, the framing question can include a criterion of fairness or justice so that recommendations must address the unequal impact of climate change on different groups. And in the implementation phase, it's important to provide financial and logistical support so that members from marginalized communities are able to take part in the process. Lesson four, government accountability matters. Climate assemblies are time intensive and they may require members to miss work. And if members feel the government isn't acting based on their work, it will undermine the democratic legitimacy of the process. And particularly on the issue of climate justice and, envir and environmental justice, which are at the top of public priorities in many countries, concrete action is very important. And finally, I'd like to emphasize that climate assemblies can provide hope for meaningful action on the issue of climate change, even despite the challenges. By listening to diverse perspectives, working together and empowering community members, we can find solutions. And to wrap up, how can we at People Powered help you? We offer free mentorship and we'll pair you with a climate assembly expert to help you get started advocating and implementing a climate assembly in your community or country. We can also provide resources, including an info sheet in six languages, as well as other guides and materials about climate assemblies and citizens assemblies more generally on our website. We organize online courses, including the previous course, How to Start a Climate Assembly. The recording is also available. And we'll also offer future courses about other participatory and deliberative initiatives for climate action. And finally, we can provide custom trainings if you'd like guidance tailored to your organization. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for that overview and particularly for addressing some of the questions um, that were posed in the first panel um, and kind of demonstrating that uh, climate justice system beliefs can be used um, in a variety of different settings and also that there, um, there is, I think, um, um, resources and kind of backing for exploring more climate assemblies um, and other types of citizen assemblies in the global south. Um, so I'd now like to pass it over to Sean, who's going to give the, the second presentation. Thanks, Rachel. Hi, guys. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here. Can you all see that? We got it? Yep. Perfect. All right. So um, I think we've heard uh, 
some really fantastic insights, uh, particularly uh, from Nikhil there, but uh, assemblies themselves. I, I guess I want to take you on a journey that we're currently going on in Ireland, um, which links the idea of, of, of you know, wh what we might consider as, as citizens' assemblies or, or citizens' juries um, to, a, to a, 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 a development pathway or an empowerment pathway, a community-led development pathway for climate justice. So just to kick it off, it's very important to state that participation is at the heart of climate justice. I've, I've been fortunate enough to be working on climate justice issues now for a long, long time. And uh, right back at the beginning of the, of the Mary Robinson Foundation, for example, we were trying to make sure that um, women from communities in the Global South grassroots participants were being heard in the UNFCCC, for example, the, a, a gap that's enormous and needs to be bridged. Um, but... Uh, we have to make sure that decision making around climate action is participative, account accountable and transparent. We have to make sure that there's social dialogue, which is the core constituent of a just transition. But we have to imagine that on a broader scale, not just between workers and unions and, and, and their employers and the government, but also at, at the community level, too. Um, and we have to try to find a way to share the benefits and burdens of climate, climate change and its resolution equitably and fairly. That is what that is a core principle of climate justice and something that I think um, these types of participative processes can enable. So the project we're going to talk about today is called the People's Transition. And I'll give you a little bit about the background, a little bit of the challenge we're trying to overcome, the plan we're hoping to use and the outcome we're hoping to arrive at. And I'm going to try to do that as quickly as possible. The two images on the right hand side of the screen are Fibsborough in Dublin. Uh, and our Dra, which is a very small village on the west coast of Ireland in County Donegal. Um, you couldn't really find two more different places, and they're the two places where we're trying to implement the people's transition currently. So the background, how did this project come about? Um, basically, it came about in response to this graph. Um, you'll be familiar with the IPCC's 1.5 report, which says we are fast running out of time. By 2030, we need... Um, globally to reduce emissions by about 55%. That means that developed countries really have a, a, um, an incredible um, burden of responsibility to reduce by much more than that in order to enable the, the global south to, to respond uh, with, with, with the capacity they need to. And, and we also know that these decisions that we're taking intersect directly with people's lives. So um, the Business and Human Rights Resource Center has seen a significant spike in allegations against renewable energy companies, human rights allegations against renewable energy companies because of rushed climate action. Um, you can hear in many different perspectives about the genesis of the Yellow Vest movement and what actually caused it, but there can be no doubt that a regressive diesel tax on top of a series of other regressive policies contributed to the rise of the Yellow Vest movement in France. And also we're seeing the far right um, uh, really use climate as, as, as a, an issue to mobilize around. So these are issues that don't just intersect with our future environmental sustainability, it is the future of our democratic sustainability that's at, at stake here. And when it comes to these sort of issues, perception is unfortunately nine tenths of the natural law. So you cannot tell farmers for years and years and years and years and years that their entire livelihood is under threat from the policies that we're going to take to counteract climate change without expecting them to revolt when, when we try to take those policies because you've built up such a level of distrust in the environmental system. Now, some of that is by bad faith actors, but some of it is by people who really are well intentioned, but aren't thinking about how their message is being received. We're also dealing with a very unfavorable landscape in terms of public trust. So this is, um, you know, this is a, a graph that I put together, which I'd be careful about drawing too many conclusions from it. But what it does show us is that as uh, the countries with the lowest um, faith in their government processes, also have the most to do in terms of climate action. Now, this is an interdependent problem that we're facing. It's no good that one country does it very well and another country struggles. We need everyone to be able to move at the same pace. And this graph here is a problem in that regard. And finally, and, and, and perhaps most importantly, um, the confluence of inequality and uh, the need for climate action pose very significant risks. So we know that there's widening inequality globally 
We also know that we're seeing a neoliberal context emerge whereby public services are being pulled back and, and, and the promotion of, of, of um, individualism and, and, and market-based approaches is, is seeing a, a significant preference. That poses challenges if we're talking about bringing communities into climate action as equal partners. We have to be careful that the assemblies that we're trying to organize don't depoliticize communities, don't instrumentalize them and, and just have them a tool for the implementation of government policy, but rather genuinely respond to the needs of government. So we, we undertook a case study for just transition and um, focus specifically on agriculture in Ireland uh, about two years ago. I ended up hopping in a camper van and driving around the country meeting as many um, farmers and fishermen and other rural livelihood um, uh, actors as, as I could. And, and quite a clear message emerged, and that's this. People care more about local development than they do about climate action. And that is not going to change over the space of time that we need it to change in order to avoid absolute catastrophe. So what we have to do is align climate action with the needs of communities. It's not about communities becoming climate experts, it's about us becoming experts in the needs of communities. And we do that, I think, using a system like this. We have to enable participation, value local knowledge, and co-create, and also allow the co-ownership of the solutions to the climate crisis. And what that will do is once you have a community engaged, uh, once they see that their needs are being addressed, they will their trust in the process will build, you will see a greater demand, you, I, will, I hope you would see a rapid proliferation of this approach if it was successfully implemented in a number of communities. So we're coupling that participative approach with the idea of local wealth building. Some of you will be familiar with it from the Democracy Collaborative in, in, in the United States or uh, the Center for Local Economic Studies, uh, CLESS in the UK. Uh, the Preston model, it's sometimes called. Um, but it's basically the idea that anchor institutions, which are your municipal institutions, are, are buying from workers' cooperatives that um, enable certain standards to be set. Uh, and once that's being done, you, you are retaining wealth. You're not, uh, where possible, influenceable spend is staying within a community and, and raising standards of living, raising working standards. Um, so just quickly, some, a lot, most of you will be familiar with these concepts, but um, community wealth builders or anchor institutions are these stable institutions that have a sense of place. What we're trying to do is couple that sense of place with progressive procurement to keep jobs locally. Um, and to make sure that uh, the spend stays within a local economy. This is, many of you will be familiar with Kate Raworth's donut economics model, but what we're trying to do here is intentionally design the social foundation upon which the safe offer operating space we need to exist in can be built. Um, so we need to identify where the community wealth building opportunities are around us. And most critically, and, and uh, sorry, I, I might uh, just briefly say the Preston experience has been remarkably successful. Uh, in, in 2012, you had a larger spend than you had in 2017, but much more of that spend in 2017 was staying within Preston, thanks to the use of this community wealth building approach. Um, and, and, and just some of the traits of a community wealth building model, it's not actually protectionist, it's, it's about maintaining fair employment standards, a just labor market, other ideas like food sovereignty can come into the picture here. Um, you have, you're ensuring the socially productive use of land, you're um, enabling active community and, and, and critically, and, and um, uh, Nikhail spoke about this in his piece, you're giving power to the community in a meaningful way, it's about actual the returning power to the local. The problem with rural areas is anchor institutions don't typically exist. And this is why Fibsborough and Ardra, the two communities that we're having our assemblies in are interesting because Fibsborough has a football stadium and a, a hospital and a, 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 the country's largest jail and a number of other places that actually are publicly owned and can contribute to these types of, of, of community services. Uh, Ardra has none of these. What it does have, and this is what's critical, is climate action. 
So we have to start thinking about how climate action itself can be an anchor institution. How can renewable energy cooperatives play a role? How can the nature-based solutions we're looking to bring in be community owned? I'm realizing I'm running out of time and I'm only hitting the dialogue piece right now. So I'll be very quick. This is the dialogue that we're hoping to run in both communities, or should I say a schematic for it. The dialogue is the centerpiece, but there's a, an extensive mapping component at the beginning to understand who should participate. It's hyper-localized, so we aren't doing random samples. We're trying to get the community to map itself and to understand who typically doesn't have voice and who typically gets excluded from these processes and try to bring them in. Then we have a dialogue. And out the other side, it's about taking the needs and priorities of the, co the community have self-identified, matching them to climate action and bringing it forward in that way. So really simply, we're, we're going to listen, we're going to learn from the communities and we're going to co-create solutions with them. Um, I'll race through this, we can come back to it, but basically it's about localizing elements of the climate supply chain, distributing them um, throughout Ireland and identifying where community business or cooperative models can take ownership it's not going to happen by accident. We have to intentionally design a system that shares the benefits and burdens. That's the key. So that's the timeline. Uh, March, April, we're in the process of landscape mapping at the minute. The dialogue phases will happen in May and June and July will be the co-creation. And the outcome, and there's a, a, a reason for this, that we are totally unsure what the outcome is going to be. It's very exciting, but it's also uncertain. We have seen great support, great will from the communities. I'm confident we're gonna see something exciting. Our aim is to arrive at a blueprint that, in, uh, that takes climate action, builds community wealth around it, and doesn't duplicate exist, existing efforts, but gives a costed holistic plan that the community can then implement. We are working to bring the politi politicians, local and national along with us, so that this can be passed off once it's arrived at. That's it. I'm sorry, I've probably taken a little bit longer. I didn't test the time of the presentation. No, no worries, Sean. Actually, that was that was really great and fascinating. And I think it was really beneficial for participants to hear the beginning part of the process um, and, and to hear about, you know, making sure that this is an opportunity to increase democratic culture and practice, that we're not tokenizing communities and that it really needs to be a holistic design. And I think the economics piece was also really fascinating. And, and norms around the topic of climate change, right? And, and how you approach this differently in, in rural communities versus urban communities. So I think there was a lot there to digest, but I think it was really great. Um, I now wanna pass it over to Kazia, who's our final panelist, um, who will be talking about the Warsaw example. Um, so um, um, please definitely, you can share your screen and get started. Thank you very much for the, for the invitation. Do you hear me well? It's okay, okay. So let me just share the... Mm, the slides. Hmm. Full screen. Okay. So my name is uh, Kasia Pawłowska and I uh, work uh, in Warsaw based NGO, as you can tell uh, looking at the flip chart behind me. Um, we, we focus mainly on three areas, um, social innovation, social research, and um, civic participation. And um, now I'm uh, going to share with you some of our experience with uh, the Warsaw Climate Assembly. Um, it wasn't maybe the iconic, ideal example of Climate Assembly, in, uh, but it was the first one held in the capital of Poland and um, the first in Poland to be conducted fully online. And I was a member of a steering group uh, of the assembly. So uh, I'll give you some insights into uh, how and uh, thanks to whom it was all started, uh, how it was uh, designed, uh, what impact it made and uh, what we learned um, from, from this process. Um, and as Nikhil said, um, it started with uh, a grassroots and NGO activists uh, advocacy campaign. Uh, it was uh, uh, almost two years ago and it was a um, very long and tiring journey for, for the activists. It, uh, it, it took a year and a half to be exact uh, to, to, to launch the, the, the whole process. 
Uh, and the process itself uh, was only one month long, so uh, a little bit of waiting for, for that. Uh, I uh, won't go into details of the uh, timeline. Uh, I just um, maybe mentioned that the, that the whole campaign was really effective. Um, the city hall responded positively to the petition uh, and then began to, uh, to design the process with the help of the um, campaign initiators and they discussed and framed the assembly questions. It is uh, put in the, the green box here uh, and made some other um, decisions on the design um, of, the, uh, of the assembly. Um, and or maybe one, one more thing, and we, we stepped in in June 2020 uh, when the public tender was uh, released. We, we were chosen to conduct the assembly. Uh, our preparation started uh, in September after the first uh, COVID uh, attack. Uh, and then we, uh, we um, launched the, the process at the beginning uh, uh, of November, uh, despite the second wave. Uh, so it was, uh, it was the, the main challenge of ours at the time. Um, okay, uh, the whole process was, uh, was done online. At the very beginning, we hoped that we could uh, meet in person at least once uh, at the very first meeting, but um, soon it turned out uh, to, to, to be just impossible, of course, due to uh, pandemic. And it was a technic uh, technically demanding process. Obviously, um, after many months of online work, uh, we were uh, somewhat experienced in conducting online meetings, workshops or trainings, but an online assembly is uh, really far from the ordinary uh, online meeting. So, so we felt like a, a bit like uh, at NASA operating center uh, from time to time. Um, uh, how, how did it look? Uh, we, uh, we ran it together with uh, two um, other Warsaw-based NGOs, about 10 to 15 people, facilitators, technical support, uh, were engaged uh, in the process each weekend. And we started with um, sending invitations um, signed by the mayor to 18,000 postal addresses, uh, which were chosen by lot. And the number of invitations uh, per district was proportional to the number of uh, their uh, residents. And then we um, randomly selected 90 assembly members, uh, people from all walks of life, all young uh, men and women at all levels of education and, and place of living. And we invited them to eight online meetings. Um, five of them uh, were obligatory and others took place on uh, weekdays evenings and we were aimed at um, additional uh, expert speeches, question and answer sessions or different technical issues. And as in all uh, assemblies, we, we started with, with the learning phase when members could, could hear evidence from different experts. Uh, and then we uh, supported them to deliberate on uh, what they heard about all the recommendations and finally to vote uh, for, uh, for the best of them. And we, uh, we did our best to be attentive to the needs of, of people who were, for example, digitally excluded or had some difficulties uh, using Zoom. Uh, we provided them with technical support during the process and uh, some of them of personal assistance. So they, they had uh, somebody to help them during the meetings if uh, it was needed. Um, and we, as the steering group, had an ass assistance as well uh, because none of our uh, organizations had um, environmental or climate background or expertise. We invited two independent scientific advisors to, to, to support us. And during the, the process, we, uh, we held public consultation to, to open it to, to all residents of, uh, of Warsaw. Um, and these two um, are the only two people I met in person during the, the process because we, are, uh, we were filming uh, 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 video material. So uh, it wasn't online uh, as a whole. I, I met two persons uh, from the assembly. 
and uh, what was the main result of the assembly? Uh, members decided on the recommendation. They uh, the recommendations. Then they chose 30, 49 from over 90 uh, proposals. Um, and they, um, as you can see in the green box, uh, they they are really diverse, huge and small. Uh, uh, costly and uh, easier to, to impl implement. And uh, after a few, mon few months, um, City Hall uh, um, prepared an implementation plan in response to the, to the recommendations. And um, they, they gave some details on uh, budget and timeline, timeline and they, they, they will be updating and adding more details uh, in it in the future. And um, for now, we, we know that uh, some of them will be implemented uh, really soon. Uh, I gave three examples of them on the, on the slide. And what were our biggest uh, struggles during the, the process? Obviously, COVID, uh, and we had some problems with uh, with timing. We hoped to conduct uh, the assembly at least partially offline. It couldn't be helped uh, because of the pandemic. Um, and when we sent the invitations, uh, the the situation uh, with pandemic in Warsaw wasn't as bad. So we uh, we thought that it will be doable to to meet with people, but. It changed very quickly, and by the deadline of uh, of registration, we um, we were in um, so-called red zone and area with the most severe restrictions in Poland. So it it became obvious that we will uh, not meet uh, with uh, assembly members. So we had to become more flexible and uh, to fluently adjust to to the changing circumstances, uh, and always have uh, have a plan B. Uh, during the, um, the process. And because of the tender design, we had uh, really very little time uh, to conduct the assembly. It, it was, as I said, all done during a month. We met frequently without um, taking longer breaks. So, um, so we left um, members with very little time for absorbing the knowledge, all the information and uh, discussion between them. And it was uh, quite intense, both for us and for um, assembly members. And the, the, the last thing, the last challenge I, I uh, want to, to speak about is the technology. Uh, we found that uh, lengthy processes, deliberation and thoughtful um, decision making uh, is um, really hard to do fully online. Uh, it's not impossible though, you just have to be uh, better prepared or prepared in a um, different way, maybe. Um, at the beginning, we plan to use many different fancy online tools, but after first meetings with members, we decided that um, we should stick to just Google Documents and Padlet and introduce any new tool uh, occasionally uh, and we, um, with uh, great care. Because um, if you choose, um, choose people by lot, uh, you then meet with a group um, uh, with a very wide range of skills and, and capabilities. And you have to bear it in mind during the process that technology, I think, should be inclusive, not breathtaking, I would say. So uh, three lessons that we learned from the, um, from the process, despite those challenges. Uh, and I would, I would say uh, that if you are willing to conduct an assembly, thinking about it, uh, do not let the COVID or any, uh, any other circumstance uh, scare you uh, um, and just, just act, just do it. Even pandemic should not stop uh, anyone from trying to connect with people and to, to jointly make policy changes, um, especially in these times and in climate related topics. So the, the urgency here is overwhelming, I, I would say. And um, remember to, to make it wisely, to take as much time as needed to come to good thought through conclusions. Um, and the last thing, go simple with the technology. Uh, and I, I think I, I can leave, leave it there for now.
Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Kazia. That was also really fascinating. And, and thanks for providing us, I think, a lot of detail into, into the process. Um, we do have, we are running short on time, but I do want to uh, make time for a couple questions that came through the chat. Um, so the question is around accessibility during climate assemblies. Um, so how do we ensure that all participants needs are accommodated and particularly with COVID-19. So Kazi, you started talking about the impact of the pandemic and, and Sean, I think you can speak to this as well as the pandemic is ongoing. Um, has it impacted participation in any way, particularly for certain groups that might be harder to reach like people with disabilities, for example? Uh. Yeah. <laughs> Can I go first? Uh, okay, uh, maybe I, I will say only that, um, that uh, we, we felt that um, COVID changed the situation uh, with, with, the, with the, for example, um, the rate of response for, for, for our uh, invitation only over uh, 300 households uh registered to 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 be a part of the uh, of assembly so probably they they were thinking that there are more important issues to deal with at the time uh while being at red zone uh of covid so it was it was tough but um we uh we tried from the beginning uh, to be um to be as inclusive as possible, to use as um, simple uh, language as possible. Do not use any, um, I don't know, um, elaborate things. Uh, try to, 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 to be as straightforward as, as you possibly can and try to, um, to tell, uh, tell people that, that you will be a support during the whole process. So we, we reimbursed all of them. We uh, asked, asked for uh, their needs at the very beginning. They, they could uh, apply for uh, technical support uh, for um, electronic devices from us. So, so there, are, there are more things to do in order to, to make all people uh, be a part of the assembly, I would say. And it, it, it's worth uh, trying to do it. All of that, all of that yeah. ring, ring, <laughs> rings true for me. I, I just add a couple of pieces. Um, we have some interesting challenges um, in that, say, in, in our rural community, broadband is not um, readily available. Um, we also have older communities who aren't necessarily online. Um, so what we've done is, is we've got some um, uh, guides, we're calling them, um, small groups of both communities who are steering us on where the gaps in our own knowledge might be and they're helping point us to maybe uh, where the points of community are that that could serve as activations even during COVID. So for example uh, to overcome the issue of, of, of the older community and um, we uh, not being online we have put we're going to put surveys in the post office where they pick up their pension we're going to put them at the shops where they places where where community members pass through on a regular basis to make sure that their voices are heard in the initial setup. We're also working with them. Um, we're, 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 we're setting up a plan to work with with children and schools to begin a conversation there that we hope will spread into families that way. So um, th that's the first piece. And just on the language piece, what what's very important for us and definitely what the research pointed to is. Um, making it relevant to um, people's lives is is very important and so it's not about talking about climate really so much as talking about addressing fuel poverty or um, looking at warmer homes or, or reducing electricity bills like there's so many people who are in a heat or eat dilemma where they can either heat their homes or they can they can they can uh, feed their family and that's a unconscionable decision for any country in the world to make but it's especially a wealthy country for people to be living in that situation is, is absolutely outrageous so we need to make it about those issues and not uh, as as rose wall who works with climate uh, community law and mediation here in ireland has said it's for the people who are worried about the end of the week not the end of the, the world and, and that's where we have to target our, our focus 
Thank you, Sean. And um, Nikhil, did you want to add anything before we wrap up this panel? Yeah, I think just thinking broadly about accessibility, climate change, I think different community members will have different levels of understanding of the science and the impacts going into it. So that's why it's really important to spend time on the learning phase and to allow the members to hear from different perspectives on the issue so that they can enter the deliberations with a level field of knowledge. And th that way they can feel that they're able to use their voice and that they're empowered to make recommendations. Yep. Great. Thank you. So I, I'd like to, again, thank all of my panelists. Um, this was really fascinating. And I think um, it will definitely get rewatched by a lot of our, um, our staff and partners um, as they're kind of digging into, you know, how to apply climate justice assemblies in their local context. Um, in closing, I'd like to pass it over to Laura Norti. So Laura is a senior portfolio ana analysis at the Open Society Foundation for Europe, and her work focuses on democratic innovations in Europe, particularly supporting communities that are fighting economic exclusion, um, and, and in particular access to housing and, um, and supporting workers. So um, Laura, please take the floor and, um, and um, we'd like you to offer any reflections that you have. Sure, sure. Thanks everyone. And thank you, Rachel, for the introduction. And the invitation as well. Um, there was a lot that was said, um, and it's great to hear from many panelists who, some of whom we work with at OSF um, over the past few years. So I agree with what Claudia was, Claudia was saying on the report about addressing polarizing challenges and when you know, citizens' assemblies are shown to solve one problem or one type of problem, they can give inspiration to solve other types of problems. And um, I resonate with, with March's enthusiasm um, for these tools being used at, for this decision making. And like Shana mentioned, I always, always question whether the UK would have had a different Brexit or even Brexit at all, had we had a citizens assembly or some sort of deliberation alongside a referendum. And, and would, it have, would it would have had the same impact on public opinion on such a polarizing issue? And as I engage in this work, I often think about my friends back home, I'm based in Barcelona, I'm from the UK, who have no relation to this work whatsoever, um, and what kind of impact this work would have had on them. And, and some of them had some really misled opinions about Brexit. Um, but as Martin said, you know, common good is at the heart of the problem. And if, you know, a citizens assembly, if it's well done, would have provided an opportunity for a more neutral education on what it really means for Brexit, for example, and to hear from different perspectives and could have helped define the question better, maybe for the referendum. Um, and as Sean said, um, you know, participation is at the heart of the assembly. The benefits of deliberative democracy for participants is that it builds an understanding of the issue, but also an understanding of what the trade-offs trade are, and we don't normally get mutual points of view on those. But most importantly, in my opinion, is that people feel that they're part of democracy. And if it's done meaningfully, then even more so. Um, I just want to point quickly to um, the Open Society Foundation's interest in the Lotus democracy. Um, so for those who aren't familiar, um, Open Society Foundations is a global network of philanthropic foundations, and I work for the Open Society Initiative for Europe, or OCFE, as you'll hear me re refer to it, which is the grant-making arm in Europe. And we work on different issues, including human rights movements, justice and democratic practice, and the latter drives the inspiration for the portfolio that I work on, which is that everyday people have access to democracy and have meaningful influence in policymaking um, on, the, on issues that affect their lives. We see it as an alternative to authoritarianism and populism, and it gives a chance for people who are most far away from engaging in democracy to have a voice. Um, and over the past four years, our relatively small but ambitious portfolio within OCFE has been the only one in the entire open society network with a targeted focus on deliberative democracy and, and it's just one of the, the innovations that we, we support in Europe. And, and as the energy grew around citizens assemblies and other processes um, and as the energy started to grow, and we saw this um, particularly in Belgium, um, Poland and the UK, um, but most importantly, that there was an increase in desire from citizens and also a growing appetite from governments to, to support and, and host them. 
this became our most honed area of work. And so far we had um, been supporting the facilitation of them and the design of the selection process, but not the actual cost of the assemblies. And we also um, engage with other partners to help ensure good quality um, with the hopeful institutionalization um, at some point as well. Um, initially, we focused on the democratic innovations in and of themselves, but now we're looking to shift our focus as a donor on particular issues, um, such as climate assemblies and the meaningful use of those. Um, and just quickly, um, three important things, um, or three things that are important for us as we, as we move forward is meaningful participation. So looking at who gets to participate and how the deliberative processes are communicated. And as Kathy has said, what language resonates with the audience and how, and how to avoid preaching to the choir, as Shana was saying. Uh, meaningful institutionalization so that it becomes a habitual part of democratic process and also meaningful impact that the recommendations are actually implemented. And we've seen cases where when they're not, people lose faith in the process and become distant and disillusioned again, and which is what we don't want with, with, with these processes. Um, we, as, as has been said before, we believe the desire for assemblies and other processes should come from citizens, um, but also that it should be the role of governments or a decision-making body to fund them and not, um, not donors. I'll emphasize what Claudia and Shana has said, is that while we're enthusiastic about these tools, we're very much aware that it's not the silver bullet for all of the political challenges of today. And in fact, there's a danger of it being seen as such. Um, so as I said, we're increasingly interest, interested in climate assemblies and we're hoping to develop a stronger body of work in this area. And we're also trying to demonstrate to our colleagues um, working in, in other areas as to how deliberative processes can be applied to other issues. Um, I'll just quickly end by saying that we're still learning a lot and it's great to be engaged with other experts and, net and networks in the field. Um, but at the same time, it's important to think of our role as a donor. And right now we're still questioning that as we're kind of thinking on the strategy and, and we're still figuring out our niche, but it's important to be led by civil society. So thank you. Thank you so much, Laura, and thank you to everyone that was able to stay on to the end. I know that we went over and also thank you to all of our panelists um, on the CP team or citizen participation team. We're really eager to continue to stay in conversation with our partners, with researchers, with donors, and, and to really explore our role in supporting processes like this and, and moving them forward, but also getting the right tools um, and information in front of our partners in all the countries where we work. So thank you again for participating. And uh, we really hope that this is the start of a conversation and the start of more opportunities for collaboration and support. Um, thanks again. And, and, and I hope that everybody has a great rest of their day. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Rachel. Thanks. It's good to see you. Good to thanks, see Rachel. Have a great everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Rachel. Bye.